Hello from Denver again. Uh, we have one more presenter this morning, but we have two more sessions today with some very exciting acoustical science research presentations. One at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, and being an East Coaster, it's been throwing me off all week. And another at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, if you missed this one or you can't catch up with the other ones, we're going to have recordings available later on this week. So reach out to us and we can get those to you as well. But let's focus on the here and now. Our third presenter, Lauren Freeman from the Naval Undersea... Where, <laughs> Naval Undersea... Why can I not say that? Warfare Center Newport. I'll get it right. Uh, as many know, the, the health of our coral reefs and our oceans are important to our the health of our uh, oceans and our planets. Um, Lauren has been listening to the reefs and its residents to hear them talk about how they feel. Lauren. Thank you so much, Larry, and thank you everybody for tuning in today. I'm really excited to share some of my research with you. I'll be talking today about soundscape work that I've been doing with colleagues at Naval Undersea Warfare Center in Newport, Rhode Island, as well as Department of Energy, ARPA-E, and Scripps Institution of Oceanography as part of University of California, San Diego. And most of what I'll be speaking about today are coral reefs. As Larry mentioned, corals are both a magnificent part of our ocean and they're under dual threat from human use and climate change. So coral reefs really suffer from overfishing, from pollution, as well as warming oceans and acidification from climate change impacts. We've been monitoring our coral reefs in the marine ecology community for decades now, and that's usually conducted by placing divers or snorkelers in the water, and that's a relatively invasive and expensive procedure. Passive acoustic monitoring offers a window into individual reef habitats and into some of the health and heartbeat of those reefs that is can last much longer in time, covers a large geographic area, and is also quite a bit less expensive than those point surveys by divers. So I just want to briefly talk about a paper that I'm highlighting here from a few years ago um, that I published where we learned from an experiment conducted along the entire Hawaiian island chain all the way up to the Pacific Monument in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, that there's very strong indicators in the reef soundscape or in the acoustic signals that are coming out of the reef as to how healthy that reef is. So one of the big indicators of a reef that's more degraded is that you have less of that really beautiful coral that you can see in the inset figure here, and it's being overgrown by a kind of nasty, fleshy macroalgae. Um, and we were able to link that to the acoustic signature of the reef. The algae was associated with more high-frequency sounds that we actually tied in a different experiment to the photosynthesis of the algae and release of bubbles rising through the water column. So I've been working on this for the past um, more than five years. I'm not going to add while I'm standing up here. And during the course of that time, I have been leaving sensors in different parts of the ocean to try to understand some of the longer time series. What does the soundscape look like? What is the variability across a day, a week, a month, a year? And we'll be going through a couple of those today. So this is a site in Hawaii near the island of the big island um, with the volcano on it on the Kona side. This covers a two-day period. Your time is on the x-axis. If you can't make out those, um, the military time on there, that's local time, and the dashed red lines indicate midnight. The top panel shows a larger frequency range from 0 to 40 kilohertz, and the lower is that exact same data. It's just zoomed in on the lower frequencies. And the color indicates effectively how loud is it, how noisy is it, what's going on. These are from a single recorder that's taking in everything that's happening around them. And hopefully a few things stand out to you right away. There's quite a lot we can see from the single sensor that we left on the seafloor. What I'll be talking about more today is that nightfish chorusing, that nice green blob that shows up, not at midnight, but during the change of light, so about when the sun comes down. Um, you see this evening chorus that's been documented by several other researchers in a number of sites around the world. And that's your nighttime community coming out to party and have a good time. At this particular site, we were here in the winter, um, which is when the humpback whales are around. And we also saw quite a few whale calls during the day. Those are a little bit more noticeable when we're zoomed into the lower frequencies. And finally, you can see the ship or boat traffic, which is one of the more pronounced signals here 
um, in the evening on the center day of this plot. So those are some of the features that you might notice on daily time scales. And then we zoomed out even further. So this is a nearby site. This is a little further south in Kona, same island of Hawaii. And this is a time series covering six months from May until early October. Um, these are, again, recorders, omnidirectional recorders. They're taking in sounds from all around them. And they're recording on a duty cycle. One of the ways we get these longer recordings is we do a duty cycle where we record one minute every 10, one minute every five. And that means that this relatively small sensor can stay out longer. So one of the first things you probably notice is that either side of this plot is blue and the middle is red. Um, so this is one of our most pronounced features of reef sound where we have a very, very strong difference in what things sound like during the day and what they sound like during the night. And we see this all over the world. And this is a characteristic that almost has to be linked to biology. There's really no physical process that's going to change your ambient noise that dramatically exactly at sunrise and sunset. So to talk a little bit more about the figure that we're looking at here, this is a time series. Your time is now going up the y-axis from May at the bottom to October at the top. So your most recent time is at the top. And along the bottom, we have hour of day with midnight in the middle. Those two black lines that are imposed on top show you the sunset and the sunrise time. So hopefully you can see how close the linkage is between that very significant increase in sound and the sun going down. And part of that is that evening fish chorus, those fish calls that we saw on the previous two-day time series where the fish are calling. But we also have placed a number of different sensors alongside these acoustic recorders and found that during night there's a significant increase in activity of all of your small little reef critters, your shrimps, your crabs, your invertebrates. And that's also a significant contributor to your order of magnitude increase in nighttime sound. Now, if you zoomed in on a day like we just did, you see that there's a little hump right around sunset time. That's that evening chorus, and that is associated with quite a few fish calls. Um, and there's also a little bit of a peak before it tapers off as the sun starts coming up. And I think of this as being associated with the changing of the guard. Most biological systems have a community that are out during the day and a community that are out during the night. We don't see this nearly as much as humans, so it might not be quite intuitive, and that's because we have the joys of technology and artificial light, and we don't necessarily ramp down our activities when it becomes dark in the way that we would have hundreds of years ago. But if you look at other terrestrial animal systems, you would see very similar occurrences where you've got animals that are predominantly out during the day and others that are often out during the night. The other thing to note about this time series from Hawaii is that there's really not much seasonal variation. So we're going all the way across the summer into the fall and we see more or less the same thing over that entire six months. Now, this is an extremely similar plot. We have the same axes. This time we're going from March through July. So again, it's six months. And this recorder is in Bermuda. So this is actually a subtropical coral reef. It's a slightly higher latitude to Hawaii. It's in the Atlantic Ocean instead of the Pacific Ocean. And hopefully you can see right away that there are some noticeable differences between these two sites. We don't have that giant red stripe down the middle of this plot. But what we do see, which is very interesting and exciting, is that there's still an increase in broadband ambient noise at night, not quite the same order of magnitude, but there's a really pronounced peak that is the order of magnitude difference occurring both at sunset and sunrise. So we're picking up that evening chorus that again has been documented, folks are studying, and has a lot of fish calls in it, but we're also seeing this dawn chorus. Um, and that's much more pronounced in the Bermuda time series than some of the other ambient noise studies that we have done. So we were quite jazzed to see that. And we also noted that here, unlike Hawaii, there does tend to be an increase in ambient noise as we move into those warmer summer months. So that's closer to the top of this plot. You can see the colors are a little less blue, a little bit more green. There's just more going on in general here. And then finally, thanks to COVID, I started doing some soundscape studies near my own backyard in Newport, Rhode Island, because we weren't allowed to travel for a while, and this was truly fascinating because up until this time, I had worked almost exclusively on tropical and subtropical reefs. So I really had no idea what we were going to find so far as ambient noise, but right away we saw that there was a very strong diurnal signal once again. Sounds very different during the day than during the night. 
but in New England, which is extremely temperate, um, doesn't have any reef building corals, very different setting, significantly louder during the day. So each of those red spikes along this time series are elevated noise during the day when your biological community comes out to play and then you have very few critters that are active at night. So there's much less of a contribution to the soundscape during evening hours. We also see some bursts in boat noise, similar to what we saw in Hawaii. This is a slightly shorter period of time uh, covering two months rather than six months that we were just looking at. And quite a bit more wind and wave noise, which makes sense. Rhode Island's just at the bottom of the roaring 40s. We do get big storms, nor'easters, the tail ends of hurricanes coming through. So that also tends to blow out your soundscape a little bit, and those are a little bit more obvious in the black line of your ambient noise level below the colored spectrogram. Um, but really fascinating to me is that we're still seeing this day-night difference, and we're still seeing that little peak and ramp up in the evening. So hopefully I have convinced you through this brief overview that soundscape monitoring at a minimum is a fascinating window to underwater ecosystems that are really hard to track on that kind of time scale with the kinds of tools that we might use in the terrestrial world, given the limits that we have working under the ocean. Um, sound also travels extremely well under the ocean, which is yet another reason to plug doing this. Not only do we get to see what's going on, we can learn about the health of the system, and we can track the health of the system over time. So the Navy, as well as many other organizations, government, non-government, in our country and around the world, are looking at a lot of ways to work on coral reef restoration right now. We understand that they're important, we understand that they're in trouble, and that ranges from creating a marine protected area where there's no fishing to transplanting corals. And soundscape monitoring is one more way that we could keep track of those efforts. We could mind how those systems are doing, see if there's any incursions of that macroalgae that causes threat to the corals. And it's very nice in that it's continuous, and again, it's very low cost. This isn't as invasive as having to go out with a boat, plop people in the water. And these are not extremely sophisticated, you know, specialty instruments either. Um, so I think there is a huge amount of potential for what we can do with this in the future. What I'm presenting about tomorrow and what we're really excited from comparing these three fairly different sites is that this day-night difference is extremely prevalent, which we had a pretty good clue on ahead of time. But we're also seeing this evening chorus um, at all latitudes around the world, which is pretty cool. And I just like to think of it as everybody gets out of work and, you know, goes and has their happy hour or goes out for dinner, does whatever they want to do. And I, in my mind, the fish are doing the same thing and they're just, you know, they're either starting or ending their day and they're overlapping with each other, excited to see one another, and I suspect the dawn course is very similar where you have that changing of the guard of your nighttime community and your daytime community. Again, that dawn course was most pronounced in our Bermuda time series as compared to Hawaii and Rhode Island, but extremely prevalent there through multiple seasons. So um, one more plug for soundscape monitoring as a way to mind the heartbeat and the pulse of marine ecosystems and I'd be more than happy to take any questions that you have. First, I think the most important question that we all want to know is how do we get invited to these nighttime parties? I think you just show up. <laughs> okay. I think, it's, I think it's one of those things where you just got to be there. I know you touched on it briefly, but do, do healthy corals sound different from dead ones other than just, you know, the life rise and fall, or is there something distinctive about a dead coral? They absolutely do, and a lot of the sound, to be very clear, isn't coming from the coral itself, which is a very small animal, but it builds up those really nice calcium carbonate reefs that create the coral reef city. It's from all the inhabitants of the coral reef city. So again, your fish, your invertebrates, think about things like crabs and shrimps and sea stars. Those are all moving around on that hard coral that makes noise. Fish vocalize and talk to each other. They also chomp on their food and chew, and they're just as noisy as people if you were walking around a shopping mall or down the busy street here in Denver. And all of those sounds come together to make this almost static or crackling background noise. It's hard to pick out any one individual feature, but it does create this overarching soundscape, and that is quite different between a healthy reef and a degraded reef. So in the paper that I very briefly alluded to, if you start to pull out individual features, looking at much smaller time scales than we're talking about here, not talking about seconds, you see that the more degraded reefs have much higher frequency sound. They're also 
comparable sound level during the day but at higher frequencies and then not nearly as noisy at night. So the healthiest reefs also tend to be the noisiest at night. They have the most going on during the evening, which makes sense because that correlates with having more animals and more types of animals that are coming out. We have a question from the audience. Yeah, so it's kind of along that same note, but is there like a, thir a certain noise threshold that you want to hit to be considered a healthy reef? That's a really great question, and I think it's going to be very site-specific. So I showed you a very healthy reef from Bermuda and a very healthy reef from Hawaii that are inset here. They don't look anything like each other, but if you were tracking those individual reefs during time, you would be able to have those thresholds from your background data. Um, so you want to be able to adjust your threshold for your current setting and for the types of animals that you would expect in that environment. Gotcha. Thank you. Oh, yeah. We can come over here. I had one more as well. Um, how, how large of an area can these, like one of these sensors monitor? My sensors are generally covering an area that spans out several hundred meters from the middle. Um, so like a very small house, if you will. Did you look at the banding in your Hawaii data? Um, like, what is it, June 2nd, 3rd, July 2nd, 3rd, August 2nd, 3rd? There's lighter data. Is there a lunar cycle in that? We are looking into that, but it appears okay. that that might be part of what's going on. Okay, because that's nicely convenient where there's no humpbacks in there on those dates. Otherwise, I would have been like, hey, Indeed. humpback whale cycle. So you have... <laughs> caught me. The humpbacks are in Hawaii in the winter. We showed you the summer for a good reason. <laughs> because while that coral reef noise is this sort of staticky background sound, again, like all the footsteps walking down the street, the humpback whales are like the bus driving through town blaring their horn. <laughs> They're really loud and not being a marine mammal acoustician myself, they get in my way. I like them very much. They're very cute, but I would like it if they didn't get too close to my research projects. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you knew if those bands were new moon, full moon, where they line up, because I don't have the lunar calendar in my head. Yep. Um, there's certainly a lunar impact, for, particularly on the fish chorusing. So a lot of our reef fish will be more active during either a full or a new moon, and there's also a lot of spawning events during the summer, which is likely part of what we're seeing here, that are also tied to the lunar cycle. Okay. Thank you very much, Lauren. Hopefully we can listen you, to our Larry. ocean friends and, and improve the condition of our planet. It's tricky. Sure hope so. <laughs> and thanks to all of you who uh, listened in for our first session. Uh, we have another session coming up at 11 o'clock. And we're going to be talking about explosions to probe our atmosphere, which is very interesting, uh, making friends and winning neighbors at racetracks. And we're going a little bit out of this world to listen to another planet and figure out what's going on in Mars. So hope you come back for that. If you missed this one or you're going to miss the other ones, as I said before, earlier, we're going to have recordings uh, available later on this week. Get in touch with us, but we'll see you back at 11. <laughs>